Hello and good morning and welcome to today's seminar uh, run by Contact and Genuine Partnerships as part of the DFE funded Early Years SEND project. Bit of a mouthful, um, but a piece of work that has been going on for the last few years uh, with all our partners and um, with CDC being the lead partner. And it's uh, um, something very close to my heart as a parent carer myself. I know how important the early years are to, to so many families. And this seminar today is very much about co-production. It's about engagement, empowerment, and measuring successful outcomes with a new tool that we've been looking at and developing uh, between ourselves, contact and genuine partnerships. As part of this project, we've been delivering co-production training, um, parent engagement with several areas across the country, uh, local authority areas and parent care forums together. And also we've been putting on lots of workshops for parents, again, across the country, online, of course, um, on many different subjects. And we've had great success with those. And many parents have given us lots of great feedback about how um, it has helped them with their children and moving forward in these early years. So I hope that you have a lovely uh, next couple of hours. I hope you learn a lot. I hope you go away with feeling that you can you can do more to um, to. Uh, involve co-production in your work and if you have any further information that you'd like please do come back to myself Gail Bedding um, as the early years and uh, the development manager for contact. Thank you and have a, a good couple of hours ahead of you. Bye-bye now. Hello I'm Philippa Stobbs from the Council for Disabled Children and it's a great joy to join you at the beginning of this day on co-production, engagement, empowerment and measuring successful outcomes. What a title. There is so much in that title. There's enough for a whole day on that. Um, but I'm particularly pleased to be here today uh, with you because um, back in the day um, when uh, the uh, Genuine Partnerships was in its early stages of, uh, of development, uh, I was in the uh, Department for Education and uh, managing the Lamb Inquiry for Brian Lamb. And one of my early uh, trips to Rotherham was to meet the parents who'd come together to uh, address the, the challenge that the Lamb Inquiry had given parents, which was to get involved in developing projects to increase parental confidence. Uh, nothing could be more important at this moment in time than doing just that. So my first hope for you is that today you are able to increase parental confidence in understanding that rights, entitlement and ways of working uh, with practitioners can, that can be really successful for, for children with SEN and disabilities. It's really another great joy for me that I'm here as the uh, leader of the uh, Early Years SEN and Disability Partnership Project, which is DFE funded, to try and make sure we can uh, make the system work better for young children with SEN and disabilities. Uh, one of the driving uh, bits of data for me is about the shocking rate of exclusions of young children from school, um, a really shocking rate of exclusions of five-year-olds. Uh, very often, um, younger children have had poor experiences of provision. And it's really to address that, that this partnership is, is working. And uh, so it's lovely that today is actually part of the EYSEN partnership uh, funded by the DfE to increase access and inclusion for young children with SEN and disabilities. It's a day which is really based on a, a really important set of values. This genuine partnerships is a completely values based uh, approach and organisation. And um, th there is nothing more important than trying to get things right in the early years for young children. We know that they have a less positive start in school. And actually, if we don't turn that around, if we don't make it work early, then we're always trying to play catch up. And that just isn't good enough for our, our youngest children who need the most support in order to be able to learn and develop it alongside their peers. So have an absolutely wonderful day of working with each other. I know you will because I've worked with Genuine Partnerships before and heard how they approach this. And I really hope it's a very successful day for you and with all good wishes. Good morning, everybody. My name is Catherine Ratcliffe. I am an associate working for Contact and uh, in recent months have been working with colleagues in, in contact on the early years partnership, delivering the specialist action learning sets 
on co-production. And I guess I'm really lucky to be able to draw on the, the experiences I have through Genuine Partnerships, being a, a director of the Board of Genuine Partnerships and seeing it develop and evolve over time. So we're delighted to share that with you. And I guess even more delighted to be able to say it's been a real privilege to see how the areas that we've worked with have adopted this model of co-production and what is coming out of that in terms of the results that they are, are achieving in their, in their own settings. You know, I am so lucky to see this work all the time firsthand and not only to see it, but to feel it and to see what difference it's making to families. So therefore I was kind of, um, really well positioned in order to respond to the request to help contact in the delivery of the uh, specialist action learning sets on the early years program um, and i'll leave that there for now i'll come back to it um, but if if claire whiting if claire could introduce herself that would be lovely oh hi everyone uh, yes i'm claire whiting i'm one of the members of genuine partnerships i'm also an educational psychologist working in, in Rotherham uh, and co-lead Genuine Partnerships together with Jane. Um, just in terms of sort of a bit of housekeeping, if you um, stay on mute and take your cameras off for now, as we're going through the presentation, there will be lots of opportunity for you to input either through the chat uh, and through some breakout rooms that we're going to do a bit later on as well. Verbally, there are quite a lot of people on the call, so um, we're not sure in terms of um, getting feedback uh, verbally, but hopefully we will, we will have that opportunity. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to hand over to um, Jane now to introduce herself. So me and Jane co-lead Genuine Partnerships. Morning, everyone. Um, um... So I'll introduce myself. My first most important role is I'm mum to six amazing young people and I'm permanent foster carer to a little boy with complex needs. Three of my birth children also have additional needs. Um, so I didn't get much sleep last night <laughs> and I really struggled to get on here this morning. So that WhatsApp group that Gail has talked about is really for that when it all goes wrong. Um, but yeah, I, I am also the strategic lead for Rotherham Parent Care Forum and I'm the steering group member for um, for the National Network for Yorkshire and Humber and as Claire said co-lead this but I think I would just like to say thank you to Philippa for that um, I remember that day so well 12 years ago I remember how my knees were knocking and actually they're, they're knocking a bit today as well because I've not had much sleep and I'm feeling really big but really the reason behind that is we just feel so passionate about this we just feel you know, from that day to this, there is still so much to be done in terms of changing the culture that is absolutely underpinning, was supposed to underpin the reforms and now the SEND review. So, um, and, and it just gets lost so often in with capacity and other things going on. So I'd just like to thank you for being here. Thank you, Philippa, for, for joining us. And thanks, Kath, for, and Contact and Gail for for hosting this event and inviting us along to share our story. Thanks, Jane. And just going to introduce Eva as well, who's here today with us. Hi, everyone. I'm Eva, part of Genuine Partnerships. I'm the business manager, but also a volunteer at Rotherham Parent Carers Forum. Got a little, he's not little, he's 10 now. It hit me saying that. Um, a boy who's in the system, and we have been for several years. Um, a very long journey with him, also under Birmingham children. So hello to them from Birmingham and a little girl as well, um, who is eight. So nice to see you all. Uh, and Eve is helping us with all the technical stuff today because that, that's not a strength for, for Jane and myself or Kath. Uh, so thank you, Eva, for that. Um, so if anybody has any questions or something doesn't make sense during the course of the session, um please jot that down in the chat or put your hand up and uh, Eva and Gail will keep an eye on what's happening in the chat I can't see that because I can just see the slides so uh, Eva and Gail are going and we'll keep an eye out for, for what's in there 
Uh, what I do need to say is that sometimes sessions like this can trigger strong emotions, take you that take you unawares. If you feel that you need a minute to yourself, please feel free to do so. Um, and it's harder to offer the support we'd normally give when it's an online presentation. But if anybody does want a, a quiet word afterwards, after the presentation, then we will stay back if anybody wants to take up that opportunity. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so th this is our vision for today, uh, that together we'll be focusing on engaging and empowering all partners in co-production, drawing upon the four cornerstones model, um, which is you know, being recognised and being used and, and Gail Bedding and I and, and Sue Manier latterly from Contact have been delivering the workshops on behalf of Contact and have seen some amazing things happen for people. And you know, it's, it's not true what they say about Yorkshire folk. We don't have deep pockets. And we've got this absolute gem of, of, of a, a way of working together uh, in, in that true genuine partnership. And we, 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 it's a gift, we're giving it to you. So, um, you know, please ask more about genuine partnerships. Um, we'll be giving you information about how to find out um, more about it later on. But we also, as, as Philippa said, we recognize the need for sometimes measuring that success that we achieve through this, through this model in particular. Because when we start, as we started to talk about the measures, we talked about that kind of um, see it, you know, uh, we, we definitely feel it. Um, and, and it's almost becomes a way of being. So we feel it, but how do we measure it? How do we see it? Because that's what um, sometimes people who um, are funders or, or, or government want to see. So we'll explore the, the measures. I have to give the warning here, um, if, if it is such a thing, that this is still in its infancy and we are hopefully co-producing it with you. So we would very much welcome your views on it. If you start to use it, um, the, the measuring tool, we'd love to hear from you about how that's going. Um, so that we can gather all voices about how it's working. Um, so we consider how the success measures can be utilised and we'll, as I say, really welcome your um, input in, into developing these further. Um, so the outcomes, um, that we have a better understanding of engagement, empowerment in co-production and to be excited about trying out the cornerstones approach and the, and the success me measures in practice. And lots of us co-produce, and we don't often put a name to it, we don't know what it is, but what we see is when people, when there's that systemic change through organisations and, and uh, frontline practice, when we can name it, uh, it's, there's an organisation about it and we feel more confident about it. As you can tell, we are very, very enthusiastic about this. Even, um, help me, is it 11 years on? Are we 11 years 12. on? 12, I think it's 12, 12 now. Oh, time doesn't stand still. Anyway, we, we hope that you enjoy the day and we hope you pick up the enthusiasm um, that, that we have for, for this model of working in co-production. Okay. So um, it is, in, uh, Claire did um, allude to this uh, earlier, um, you know, that we need to be, we are on, we are on a, a, a Zoom call, um, it is different because, you know, you can wear your jogging bottoms and um, do other things like attending to your pets that we did before you all came on the call, um, but it is really important that we are sensitive to others in the group. Bye. Thank you. Somebody's not on mute, I don't think. Um, so to be sensitive to others in the room and in what we say, um, be respectful of others' views because we all come from different places and, you know, we need to respect those, those views. Um, ensure that everybody has a chance to speak. Um, Gail Bedding may jump in there and say that includes me, to, for me to be quiet at times, but uh, hey-ho. And that we'll help one another. And hopefully you can make some connections um, today um, across the country in sharing some, some of your practice. Thank you. 
So I do apologise uh, if anybody heard some background noise then. Uh, I, I can't put myself on mute, so I would say that if there's any um, if people, um, if that happens again, if, my if our team can put me on mute temporarily. So um, I've got my son and my dad, who uh, my, my son just broke a plate in the kitchen. It's what happens, doesn't it, when you, you're online and you're working at home. Um, so one of the things that we feel is important uh, in our team to keep in mind is the language we use and how we speak about people. So we, we use these words that came from Professor Tom Billington from the University of Sheffield and try and keep these, be mindful of this way of working in our relationships with each other and encourage other people to do the same. So through the course of the session and beyond to think about how do we speak with people? How do we speak of people to others? How do we write of people? How do we listen to people? And how do we listen to ourselves when we're talking and working with people? And just to hold those in your head. Claire, just to say we could invite people to take that slide and, and copy it and put it on your wall um, in, in your office or wherever you are and remember those things. They're in, in, it's very, very laudable and they're good measures to work with too. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Kath. We, we've actually got them. So in our educational psychology service, we've got them all over the building, including in the toilets, because that's often where you go to reflect, isn't it? And then have a look at that and, and go out with a deep breath. So how did we start? I mean, Philippa and Jane and Kath all alluded to, to our beginnings and it being 12 years ago. And apologies if some of you have heard our story before. Uh, it's felt that some people wouldn't know that, and so it would be helpful to go over again a little bit of our background uh, and an understanding in terms of how we've reached this position where we're speaking to people from across the country uh, about co-production and what this means. So, as you know, our team's from Rotherham and we feel very proud about that, but we've also had our fair share of challenges, which at times have been um, very, very publicly broadcast. So, so how is it that we're here? We began a small group of us doing some research around the inclusion development programme a long time ago, and we were asking children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities how what it feels like. What does it feel like if you're a young person in one of our classrooms, in one of our schools or settings, and you, are, you have a special educational need. But what also, we asked parents, what does it feel like to be the parent of that child or young person? And we heard some very powerful stories that made a big impact on us as researchers. We were hearing a lot of anxiety and worry from parents about their children and feeling that they couldn't advocate for their children because the processes, the systems felt so complicated and, uh, and so difficult. And then the children were telling us that they didn't feel as though that they were equal to some of the other, pe other children in their classes, that they felt inferior and they didn't really think that people understood them. And so we felt we'd got to do something about these stories that we'd heard. But we also were hearing that it was really small things that made a massive difference to those experiences. And those small things were all to do with relationships, how people were with one another, how people communicated with each other. So we wanted to do something with that research. And, and around that time, as Philippa indicated, it was the uh, Brian Lambs um, report was published to improve parental confidence in SEN systems. And we were invited to a conference to present our findings, our research findings around that report. Um, and that's where we met Jane and Rotherham Parent Carers Forum. So Jane? We, we were only a small group of parents at the time. And um, I remember the feeling, you know, I think it's Maya Angelou who says, we might remember what people said and did, but we never forget how someone's made us feel. And I remember that feeling, because I can still feel it on a daily basis, of feeling sick and tired 
and feeling sick and tired of feeling sick and tired of of the what else can we do and feeling in fear and in anxiety about my child um, and so I did what what a lot of parents do um, and researched and got got the, all the information around the law and what their rights were and what education should be doing uh, and and you know could go into a school and absolutely wrote all that off and make sure that the teacher knew exactly what they should be delivering to my child but I still walked home with a massive knot in my stomach and as I said earlier I have six children and uh, at the time two of them were diagnosed and it was I, I, I had that knot in my stomach and I still can't rationalize it to this day then they're no more loved no more precious than the other four but that fear and anxiety that knot in your stomach that when you're leaving school and and it might I might you know I could have torn a strip off a teacher for example to my shame in those early days which I did because I came in fear um but I walked home understanding that actually you know there were light bulb moment when my my year six child said to me the definition Einstein says definition of madness is doing the same thing and expecting a different result and it was like a light bulb moment for me that I needed to do something differently but I didn't know what different looked like so I met two of the parents who felt the same and we trolled Rotherham and we asked parents, what is it that schools and settings do that stop you keeping your child at the heart and that it doesn't move things on, that stop, that stop those outcomes? And we got an absolute wealth of stuff. So we took it to the local authority uh, who asked us, invited us to be keynote speakers and present those findings. But at that conference, that's where we met Philippa. We, we, we wanted to do it differently, so we asked the Senkos, all 96 of them there, what is it that, that we do as families? What do we do as parents that put barriers in the way that means that you, you're not able to keep our child at the heart of what we're doing? And we got, again, a wealth of information back on that day and what, but interestingly, they were the same things. It were about anxiety, it were about fear, it were about getting it right. You know, nobody goes into a profession with children because they don't like children and they want to make life hard for parents. And and it was from that really that that coming together of hearts and minds. We met Claire and some of the other members from the inclusion team. And hearts and minds came together and we decided we wanted to do something with it. But as yet, we weren't even sure what that was. We just knew that there was something we bought on that day. And so from that, what we what we ended up with was um, this this voices presentation. Now, this is four minutes long, and the, what I'd ask you to do is just listen. These were the first voices that that we heard. These were the voices that that Claire heard and and the inclusion team when they were doing the program. They were the voices that we were hearing through parents, but we still hear these voices today. Uh, and you know, locally in Rotherham, regionally across Yorkshire and Humber, nationally we still hear these voices every day. And I'll just ask you just to, just to consider if anything resonates with you uh, and put it in the chat as we're going through. But just, it's just, we, even if we only ever had four minutes, we would always want this to be the heart of what we do. blindfold let me see again and bring back the water let your ships roll in and my heart she left a home the tightrope that I'm walking just sways and ties the devil as he's talking with those angels eyes and I just want to be there when the lightning strikes and the saints go my 
watching him and sing slow it down through chaos as it swirls it's us against the world Like a river to a raindrop, I lost a friend. My drunken as a Daniel in a lion's den. And tonight I know it all has to begin again. So whatever you do, don't let go. And if we could fly. Just start again and lift up before trouble just erodes us in the rain, just erodes us in the rain, just erodes us and see roses in the rain. Say against the world through chaos as it swirls and us against the world I think it's it's worth saying as well you know um, that these schools were they invited us invited us in in terms of this these voices and they uh, they were welcoming and they a lot of what was said when we looked further was that they just it was about the systems that were in place it were about that as a parent you know uh, i can't ask again they're too busy it, it were about it were about that stuff that that parents felt they were on their own in it so um the, what i'm trying to say i suppose is that these schools were already on a way that parents valued what they brought and they felt that they couldn't ask anymore because they didn't have capacity to give it. So just ask you just to, if you can, just anything that resonated with that, but how might things, what could have happened for things to be different for those parent carers? If you could jot them in the chat. And I think that's a, a timely reminder, Jane, um, for, for me to say what I missed out uh, early on uh, was how important it is to get this right in early years to try and prevent some of those statements being made in the future. Is there anything else that people want to pick up that's in the chat? I could see comments flashing up. Yeah, the, this one, the transparency and honesty, even when it's not what we want to hear. You know, and, and again, with, that's talking about relationship, you know, that's um, that you need relationship for that to happen, for someone to be able to say what, what's really happening and what they're feeling or what's happening at home without blame. Lots of emotion coming out. People are just saying how emotive that can be. Um, and it is, even I'm having a little tear in my ear. It's very moving, but it's, it's, it's very true, isn't it? I think as well, Gail, from a team perspective, obviously we watched this over and over and for us, it, it still resonates. And as a parent, you know, we jump in and out of these feelings all the time. Obviously, our young ones really, you know, struggle through school sometimes. But obviously, as a parent being listened to and 
you know our opinions being valued makes such a massive difference so I think obviously someone else has commented that as well and obviously remembering that we are humans families just like our own that's such a, a, a amazing comment but obviously as practitioners we also have a job to do so we you know it can be hard but to watch that day in day out is also very hard so it doesn't go away thanks Eva am I all right to carry on because I can't see what's happening in the chat thank you everyone for your comments no that's fine you carry on Claire thank you so because of those stories and because we had this opportunity to uh, put in a bid to be um, to develop an innovative project to support the work of Brian Lamb uh, we were successful in that and we carried on working together so we invited practitioners and parents and the Senkos have been at the conference to come into big rooms round big tables and blank sheets of paper to think about what was it that would make a difference what would have made a difference to those experiences what are the things that are making a difference already and it came down to four principles four key things the heart of which um, is trust because trust is something um, that, that we kept hearing you, you can't work together or feel better if you don't have trust in the people that you work that, that you're working with um, Jane, do you want to say what the principles are and then Cass going to explain them a bit later? Yeah, so welcome and care, value and include, communicate and work in partnership. But what we were all really, really committed to after hearing those voices and hearing more and more and working together across education, health, all of us in a big room, children, people, parents, carers, that these were the four things that came from the stories and the, the stories that continue to come and still come in Rotherham, still we continue to gather that, that voice and those stories. And the underpinning that we needed these four principles to underpin trust and that they needed to be embedded in a system, not, not embedded in people. People are lovely and they bring their gift, but it's not just about having them on a wall as a tick box either. You know, we, we've all seen that, but how how do we do that? And and more importantly, I think as well, what we realised really early on at this, at this that first meeting where we all came together to work on this was that if we get it right for the most vulnerable, we get it right for everybody. And what were really exciting for us as parents of children with additional needs was that quite often there's a risk assessment attached or there's uh, inclusion policies and this we need to do this and we need to do that and that's great that's great that all those things are in place but for the first time this was actually our children and people leading and that if we get it right for children with send what we do is we encompass everybody else on the journey so this is this is across whole school settings across whole service settings we're getting it right but it's being led by our children with additional needs thanks jane and so as Jane said, we, we really didn't want these principles just to be words. They had to translate into making a difference for, for those ex for people uh, and changing those experiences. And so we just carried on working together initially through the Brian Lamb work, but then we continued after that. So we created um, a self-evaluation document to enable schools and settings work out what it is, what does welcome and care look like? What does communicate really look like if you go into a school or setting? We didn't want it to feel like a negative thing. We wanted to build upon good practice that was already there. We did hear about good practice. And so we gathered examples of great um, activities and practice that was happening in our schools and settings across Rotherham. And we created a toolkit. We also wanted to develop training packages Head teachers and Senkos were saying, well, not everyone feels really confident about working in this way. So we've created packages of training about what, what does this really mean? What, what's going on underneath uh, when you're work, working in what we now know as co-production? And also to recognise, again, that best practice. So we created an accreditation process for schools and settings that involves a series of stages and that collaboratively you agree when practice feels uh, 
good enough and parents and carers and children are, are saying that this is really good practice and recognising that with Child to Gold, which we celebrate annually. So we have reviewed and reviewed our self-evaluation documents to create what we now know as the four cornerstones approach. So our charter principles, when we launched nationally, um, became the four cornerstones. And so this is freely available on our website. Anyone can use the four cornerstones approach. It's really geared towards individual schools and settings and services. To, to dig deep and to think about how, how are we doing when it comes to each of the cornerstones. And the success measures tool that we're going to look at a bit later builds upon this four cornerstones approach as a foundation. Uh, so yeah, go on Jane, sorry. Yeah, co-production involves children, young people, families, practitioners and partners all working equally together in equal and reciprocal relationship. It enables genuine participation, meaningful participation, things that make a difference and in decision making. And we are well aware that there's so many models of co-production out there. Uh, and this is such a, a wealth of good practice across, you know, certainly I, I'm, I'm seeing it all the time from lots and lots of different ways of doing this. But we, what we're also aware of is that there were no real measures there's no formal measures, because how do you measure a value? How do you measure what, what is important? And yet this is underpinning the SEND code of practice. This way of working, co-production is underpinning, but there were no real measures. And so the Voices Alliance, who, there were a, a group of partners on the slide, came together uh, to look at this, and they invited us to, to come along and be, be part of that. Um, and Looking, looking at that shared approach across the, across all all partners and all kids but what we what we what they did then was they adopted this they adopted the cornerstones as a national model because there is a measure there is a way of measuring how we welcome and care there is a way of putting this into systems and embedding it but it also completely and utterly aligns yesterday we were on a um, an NDTI for pre preparation for adulthood um, presentation a national event that, that they were doing and someone there was saying now they'd taken the cornerstones and absolutely aligned it to their co-production model which is fantastic they've got an amazing model but there's such a lot of overlap so this is this is not the only way is what I'm saying of doing it but it underpins and it can measure what we're already doing thanks Jane um what we do need to mention is that through this work with the, with the Alliance, we began to work with other areas and I was looking down the participants. It's really lovely to see names that, we, that we've encountered along the way, but we needed to do this in Rotherham as well. And so we, we did a, vo a process called Voices in Rotherham, inviting all the partners to come together, education, health, care, schools and settings, parents and carers and young people to look at what's going well in relation to the cornerstones in Rotherham, but what needs to be better. We did an event in 2017, and then we revisited it in 2019. And that's really helped us and informed our SEND strategy within the area. Um, and it's through that work that we began to look at sort of whole area practice and developed another tool, which Cass is going to talk about. Thanks, Claire. Um, so we're going to look, look a little bit more about the quality indicators um, um, and what they, what they actually mean in practice. So um, it is a changing culture and, it, and that changing culture requires us to listen to those voices. And I, I'd just like to concur with what Eva said earlier. I have seen that presentation so many times and each time I, I struggle, I really do struggle every time I hear that. And I'm sure, you know, from the comments, many of you were, were touched by, by reading those statements and, and the music really uh, added to that as well. It, it is about equality and, you know, for, um, for, for people working in organisations, sometimes it is difficult to redress the balance between 
um, delivering that service and being a recipient of, of the service and recognizing the value of that equality, um, th that we're all equal partners in this. It is about building relationships um, and working in partnerships. It is, it is also about our well-being too, because, you know, um, we know that some of those voices, you know, would have had really strong speech bubbles around them. You know, people were frustrated and angry and that affects their well-being, the well-being of the whole family, the well-being of the child, the well-being of the, the person that they're giving those messages to. So we have to be aware of well-being and this, this changing culture, what we know because we've seen it, is, is it does uh, improve well-being. And there is nothing better than having that relationship of trust in order to, to work for better outcomes for children. So when Gail Bedding and, and Sue and I have done um, these early years um, workshops, um, it, we, we, we look on the first workshop about welcome and care. And what, and what does that mean? You know, it means it's simple, isn't it? It's, we welcome and care, but we welcome and care for everyone. Everyone is welcome and, and we should care for each and every one. And I think it's really important sometimes for us to examine our own experiences of feeling welcome. You know, and, and to think about um, a, a time when you've um, experienced feeling unwelcome and I'm pretty forensic about that sort of thing, you know. Um, if I, I go somewhere and, and suddenly you don't feel welcome, you know, kind of reflect on it um, and later and think, well, that wasn't very nice. Uh, why did I feel uncomfortable? Had I got, should I have been in fancy dress? What, you know, I've I, I got the wrong frock on. Um, I, I've got my deodorant on. What, what's, what was the problem here? Um, and, you know, for us to think how that might feel. And, you know, we re obviously what we want to do is to understand each other through through these processes. And so for us to understand what that might feel like um, if you're if you're a parent carer, you know, going to a setting where you don't particularly feel welcome. So it's been an absolute joy for, for, for Gail and I to work with people in early years and to come back on to workshop too for them to tell us that they've had conversations with parents um with, with other staff about what does it feel like to come into our building that welcome and care you know get the kettle on i know it's that's not always, always practical in a in a you know in um, everyday sense but you know sometimes you know creating that feeling of that, that you're welcome and that you're invited in and we also ask people to think about a time when they, they did feel really welcome. And what were the components of that? You know, was, what was the building like? We heard, uh, and, and the person might be on the call, but we, it, was, it, it kind of led us to quite a conversation a few weeks ago of a, um, a, a clinical appointment for, for some people, parents now are um, sort of out of the main building. So parents are sent a letter. They're told to turn up to this building where they press a, a button, which um, releases the door, they come in. When they get inside, there's a desk with a phone on it. Nobody says, oh, hello, can I help you? There's a phone and they ring an extension. You know, that that is not a good sound welcome. And we, it, it brought a, quite a, a range of conversations about what that must feel like to you if you're worried about your child and worried what somebody's going to say and coming into that environment. So we do ask people to consider how they uh, create that welcoming environment. Thank you, Claire. Um, and so, so important here. Uh, I actually love this slide. So try, colleagues, stop me if I go on. So value include, uh, that we value, no matter how great or how small, we value what each and every one of us can bring to the party. You know, we, we must value everybody. And, and we have to begin with, their, with, with our perspective and understand theirs too. Mm -hmm. And you know, a life of significance cannot be achieved if you think of other people's as obstacles. And I know that some of you working in settings may have felt sometimes that the people you knew there's a massive turnover of, of staff, new people come, and sometimes it feels as though people are stepping over you to get where they want to be. But 
you know, and that they sometimes see your um, voice as an obstacle to, to their path to success. Um, it does mean when we value, um, when we're valuing people, it means we've, we value everyone. Every person has a value. I remember working a long, long time ago, setting up a new parent carer forum over in the Northwest and a very nervous young mum came and she was saying, um, well, I, I can't understand those documents. I don't know what they mean. And I don't know what words mean. What they say when they're telling me things, I don't understand those words. Uh, so I can't, you know, I can't do anything. So I said, well, what can you do? And she said, I can make the tea. I said, come in, get the kettle on. Because that, that interlinks then with the value and care. She brought something. She was of immense value. What I can tell you is that young, young mum can read those documents now. She can understand and she can take a real part in, um, in, in the process. Um, and, you know, valuing and including people is not an option not an option. Now we did steal that icon at the bottom. Um, Gail Bedding stole it, I didn't, I never touched it. Um, but you know, the, the turn of the dice, it is within your power, your individual power to include or to exclude. And the world is a better place when we include. So, and we ask, we invite people to consider whether their values match the organization which they work. we we assume often that we're, we work in altruistic environments but sometimes we have to stop and consider that and challenge that so I, and i love this quote so we had to have it in. it's it's um it's very old it's a very very old quote quote, uh, quote and i think it's from about 17 i can't remember it's about 1748 yeah something like that and I like it because we should treat people as if they were what they ought to be. And you help them to become what they are, what they are capable of being. What a gift that is too, to, to help people to achieve what they're capable of being. Thank you. And all encompassing is communication. Um, and again, just to mention that within the early years, um, parents of children just receiving diagnoses and so on, don't, don't understand the language, don't understand the Sendland language. Um, so it's important that we get the language right, that it, the language is accessible to all. And you know, good communicators, they are highly respected and trusted. And uh, to, to them, it's very important to build relationships, both personal and professional. And it's a way to create successful communication. It's about, you know, it, Jane Fitzgerald often says this, she said it to me on a call last night. Um, and I, I, I don't think she realizes how much it's there right at the front of it. It's about being real. And we talk very much about being human. Be who you are. And I often invite people to um, remove the barrier of the lanyard. You know, sometimes you're going into people's homes, you, you know, you have to for health and safety and all that business, have the lanyard. But even that communicates a barrier between uh, an, an unequal relationship. And, and good communicators appreciate and value all their relationships and interactions. Mm -hmm. around. That you know the the the, the dime the, the contribution sometimes that people you don't expect to make are absolute nuggets sometimes. So we have to be open. That communication is about listening too. So again, in in workshop two, what we've been doing on the the early years program is to invite um, participants to consider a time when they they've not been listened to and and how that that feels. We do, don't we? We stamp our feet because we, you know, we have, we believe that we, sometimes that we have a value in something that we're going to say and people aren't listening and it's really important. And that, that role of the parent as the expert, they know their children well, but sometimes are not um, valued and enabled to communicate what it is that they know. And we have to be ready to listen to that. One of you know, the most powerful experiences for me was 
um, when I was um, set, when I set up family intervention projects, and we got to a point where the parent and and the um, the young man chaired their own meeting, you know, and they and and giving them the power to um, kind of uh, organize this communication in a way that they understood. It's 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 a great thing to to um, help people to do that. And, you know, we have to consider a time when we are listened to and what, a, you know, what an experience that can be. We're all here for one thing. There is one reason we're all here. There's one reason why you're on the call this morning, on this session this morning. And the one reason is we want the best for children, young people and their families. For no other reason. Otherwise, you know, we'd be doing other things. And language is, is very, very important. And I, I think the Jane, you're going to take this part, are you? Yeah, we couldn't. I, I had to interject and stop Kath in her flow as we're going through cornerstones because this it, language is just so, so key to everything. And as parent carers, we pick up this language too. But there are, you know, acronyms. We, 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 learned that, we learned the language of Sendland. We learned that native tongue. And I saw this quite some years ago now, either another forum or another... A parent group of special needs that that saw this and it really resonated with me in how I speak and it goes back to what Claire was saying earlier what Tom Billington said how do we speak of people and how do we write of people and when you see IEP reports and how we and our EHC reports and all of that stuff so my disabled child has a placement my non-disabled child goes to school my disabled child uses special transport. My non-disabled gets a bus, et cetera, et cetera. And just keep going, Claire, with those. You know, the, the just just to be mindful, always mindful that we 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 don't as parents we don't choose to be in send land. We we land in it, um, but we we can soon. And sometimes we need to use that language because we need to be uh, to be equal partners. But to always be mindful of. Is this real into like Kath was just saying in terms of my child and communicating and how are we writing? How are we speaking of? And what our children and people tell us is that they what they want is to be the same as everyone else. They want the same opportunities, they want the same, the, the you know, the same thing, go to parties, all of that stuff. So how do we write of that? It's just to be mindful of that. Thank you. Um, so working in partnership and, it, you know, this is absolutely key to how we improve outcomes for our children, young people and their families. Um, and it has to be more than a talking shop. I spent many years going grey, talking um, and nothing happening. Um, I remember you probably many of you can probably remember the common assessment framework when that was being developed. I started with brown hair and I ended up with it grey. Um, so the progress is, was, was somewhat slow because um, sometimes we do feel that we, we meet for meeting's sake. Um, but, and we need to be clear about why we're coming together and what would be the most uh, appropriate structure to meet the needs of those that we're giving our services to. You know, co-production is truly, absolutely about people. It's not about buildings. It's not, it's not about files. It's not about anything other than about people. Um, and it's important to remember that organisations themselves don't collaborate. People collaborate, participate and co-produce. So important. And as we, we're talking, and we'll talk about this more, as... As we're going through the cornerstones, you will see how the, the interconnectedness between between these things. I'm not going to I'm not going to sing the song yet, folks. I'll sing it later. But um, you know, it's ultimate that the ultimate success or failure of partnership rests with people around the table. Um, so, and we should put those that are, are going to be the beneficiaries at the heart of co-production. And and. Working co-productively, it's not easy. There are some bumps in the road and it's not, not a quick fix often. You can get some quick wins out of it, but it takes time. But it shouldn't be embarked upon, If it, it should only be embarked upon rather, if it leads to, to better services for the beneficiaries. So in your organization, you need to agree that vision. 
to to be clear about why you're coming together and that you should be able to communicate that vision um, of, of that partnership that you've formed. And the process of, of agreeing a vision is very important as people get involved in partnership. You heard about the, the sheets of paper and we can all remember that room, I'm sure, over time when there was, you know, there was um, flip chart paper um, on the walls, it was on the floor, uh, if there'd been anybody tall enough, I'm sure we'd have had it on the ceiling. It was, and it was, you know, it was constantly talking and thinking and having those conversations, so important. And it's, it is um, essential for each participant to be clear what they're signing up for. So we need that vision. We need clarity and we need consistency. We know, need, need those three things to have to, to happen and then we'll co-produce. Thanks, Kath. And back to Kath's slide again, uh, with the flip of the dice, it can go from inclusion, exclusion, that everybody, we have the power together, collaboratively, we have the power to make that difference, to make that change. Um, working towards improving those indicators described in the Four Cornerstones approach, creating that culture. It's about culture and ethos, a culture change. And it's through that culture that co-production begins to grow. And you can, through those relationships, strengthen trust. And when trust is there, when relationships are strengthening, the quality of the relationships is improving, then there are better outcomes generated for all. And I think I have to say, we don't get it right all the time. None of us get it right all the time. We make mistakes in our team. We make mistakes. Uh, and some of, some of that happened a little bit earlier this morning. Um, but the, the thing about it is that if you've got trust, you can forgive some of those errors, some of those mistakes. We are people after all, we're human beings after all. And we can share how it feels to be in that position. And there will be people to catch you, people to support you. And it's having that kind of culture where together you can collaborate, you can work on things, you can make mistakes, you can build upon strengths uh, and make things better for everyone. Jane. Oh, sorry. I was <laughs> yeah, so in terms of the co-production, you might, you might be familiar or not with the participation ladder. And it's, um, this is, we, we rather see, We'd rather see it as something as building really and look at its equal partnership. Because co-production is looked on as the as the like the golden, that's the pinnacle, that's where we need to be. Um, but equal partnership can be can be the same in all of these key elements. For example, just this week I had some information about um, school transport. And that and I was treated as an equal partner in that. I am an equal partner in that, but I didn't need to seek transport policy or budget or everything else for that to be meaningful for me and our little one. It didn't have to happen. I just needed that information and to be treated as an equal partner. The consultation, sometimes we're asked uh, what we think about, you know, what, what, what we want things to happen. Sometimes it's, it's not about writing the consultation ourselves. It's, it's about it's about being part of that but all again just being always throughout all of these things the key is that it's in equal partnership i think that's it for me claire with this one okay and thanks jane and you'll see that there's some um babushka dolls some russian dolls on the picture so uh, kath will also allude to them in the next slide but for me it's about looking at the size of the dolls so they all fit in you, you'll have seen them and the, the little doll that fits into the middle and then the other dolls you build round. But if you look, you've got the tiny doll and you've got the big doll and the ones in between. When you think about co-production and working towards co-production, it's trying to get to a point where you would you really address power issues based on. So if it's equal partnership, if it's co-production, everyone should feel as though they're the same size doll whether it's in a room around an individual child, where's the child's voice in that? How big a doll do they feel? Have they got a voice? How do people feel in that room? Is, how's the parent feeling? Do they feel as though they've got 
that, that same degree of power in the decision making that's about their child and about their lives as the practitioner is about somebody who might not be in the room which might be a decision maker in the in the local authority so it's trying to create a context at an individual level at an organizational level at a strategic level that enables people to feel comfortable with one another as people so that they can have an equal voice they feel the same size in terms of voice and power as everybody else Path. Okay. Um, now, I um, I it's the difference between an edu education psychologist and me because uh, I see those dolls differently. I have two sets here on my windowsill, and um, probably because we've got background on, you won't see it. But um, usually, when we're in the workshops, we're unpacking them, and I I des I describe them in a different way. That the the doll on the outside is is central central government. And then we get to local government. Um, so we've got the um, government making uh, legislate, forming legislation. Then we've got local government who implement that le legislation through their procedures and policies. Then we get to the more frontline services and then to the family and to the child at the center. And there is an e unequal thing in terms of size. Um, but it is all about getting to that child at the centre. And I often say that it needs all of those dolls to align and to face that child in order to get the best outcomes. Now, I said earlier on, didn't I, that uh, we folks in Yorkshire do not have deep pockets. So when I sent for my um, very expensive set of babushka dolls from Amazon, um, I sent for two because uh, I thought I, I lose things. Um, and I was just about to use the other one when I realised some little smart person in a factory somewhere had had glued it together and it wouldn't open. And I was just about to send it back with my complaint uh, and asking for a refund when I realised that that actually demonstrates something else. It demonstrates that unless we are all open to working together, then we will never, ever get better outcomes for children. So I thank sincerely the little person in that factory who glued it together because it does show something else. And, you know, we are, we are, I, I make no uh, apologies really for saying this, being repetitive about this. We are about better outcomes for children and young people and their families. And, you know, embedding those four cornerstones helps all of those dolls to work together. So if you imagine that one of them knocks, falls over because it doesn't want to play, then there's an interruption to the process. There's an interruption to getting the very best because there's something that one of the dolls, that the second one down say they don't play ball, then they've got, you know, they, they have the funds to uh, implement that, you know, those policies and then things don't happen. So it, everybody has um, a, a part to play. Thank you, Claire. And similarly, can't emphasize enough that this is about good quality relationships, aiming towards strengthening relationships and um, understanding that, uh, thinking about some of the psychology behind that. So it's a systemic practice there. That, that's all this means. It's about being mindful of as organisations and individuals within those organisations really emphasising the relationships between people and creating the culture and ethos and conditions within that building within that organisation to enable that to happen. What is that reception area like? Does it help people feel as though they're welcomed into that organisation? What's the induction process like for new staff? And we'll come on to some of those things later when we talk about the success measures. What this means for us as a team is that everybody's involved and paying attention to making sure that everybody's involved and thinking about what happens in that space between people um, in terms of building those relationships and that should absolutely involve the children themselves and their parents and carers within a, an early year setting 
So one way of thinking about it is if you think about a problem situation, something might have happened, there might be an issue around a child. Working with each other systemically means getting rid of the blame that might be around that situation. There's a We all do it. There's a tendency to think, all right, so it's something within the child. It's the child's fault. Or what have the parents done? Or it's that practitioner that they don't get on with. It's their fault. Working systemically, it's trying to move beyond that because that doesn't help anybody and just makes people feel bad. Instead, it's, it's how can we work together to think of the best outcomes for that child? How can we build those relationships so that we can have those conversations and work together? We might not all agree, but we can have the same aim, the same outcome in mind. Uh, something else that's impo important, we feel within when working in co-production, we, we hear lots of difficult stories. We've heard, we heard those powerful stories, experiences that pet families and young people had experienced earlier. And we know that for some families, it can feel like a constant battle for needs to be met for their children. And we hear that every day. But we try to shift the focus to, so what is it we need to do better? What can we strengthen? What do we need to build upon? rather than continually going back to the negative. Um, previously, people used to go to see psychologists because they thought that there's something wrong with that child or there's something wrong with that family. We try rather to, to look at, so, okay, let's ex look at people at their best, organisations at their best, build upon strengths, work from there. It doesn't mean that those experiences, difficult, painful experiences didn't happen. It's important to acknowledge that, but then it's moving beyond that to think what works then for that child? What works in this situation? What are they good at? What makes them resilient? And it can be difficult for human beings to do that. We're pre-programmed um, to survive. And that means we're always looking out for threats. And that's why it, it's hard to trust. But by building on strengths um, and talking more about what we do well can generate a feel, a more optimistic feel and ethos, which we all need and that can bring big changes. We know that this can make a change and a difference. And so with this in mind, just for a couple of minutes, think, think about the last week that you've had and something that went well. Uh, for you so it might be something that you've achieved that you that's gone well and it can be you know in our culture British culture we, we tend not to do this we tend to be quite shy and embarrassed about it but think about something that's gone well that you've done well over the over the last week and, and Jane and Kath I don't know if you've got any examples that you can think of uh, yeah, I'm just, oh, yeah I'm just, I'm just thinking of because um, actually for me to think about what went well I have to think about where I am right now. And actually it looks like there's a lot not going well at all uh, in terms of work and some really difficult conversations locally with partners, but implementing some things, but feeling really tired and uh, and as a forum feeling really tired. And then just a uh, day before yesterday, I got a message into our inbox from a parent who said just what, who doesn't know what I might be doing strategically or what another strategic rep might be doing, but has said what an absolute impact that that this particular piece of work has done has been for her and now being involved with the forum and meeting people, she's less isolated, she feels empowered, she's given suggestions for workshops and it just absolutely hit me like it just made everything so worthwhile everything it, it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if I, we don't see it it's making a difference and what what it reminded me of a, that starfish story where there's a little boy on the beach and he's there's all these starfish being thrown out of the sea and he's going along picking them up one by one and throwing them back in but as fast as he's throwing the one there's another hundred coming at him and someone says to him what's the point you're not you're not making a difference you can't make a difference and he picked one up and lobs it and said, I have to that one. And that's it, it really reminded me of that. So really reaffirmed me in, in that what, what we're doing as local parents is really 
yeah, it's really going well. And that each of us contributing wherever we're contributing is making a difference. Thanks, Jane. Kath, have you got an example? Uh, I think um, despite my, uh, and I know other people make reference to my uh, longevity and my years, um, it's still really important, you know, to get those positive messages. And, and I did get one this, this week. I've been working in establishing a new parent carer forum uh, down in, in, in the southwest. And, um, and the person I was speaking to um, said, when, when we finish, when you finish working with us, I must write and tell them what an absolute joy it's been to work with you to for you to and I said hey don't worry about it you are paying me um and she said it's not about that though is it, it it's about your commitment to the work and it just your the, the accessibility we've had to you to you and what you've given to us and what we've achieved because now in this area for the first time our voices are being heard oh, that sent a shiver down my Fine, Kath, when you said that. Another Thank one you. That, that I yeah, another one that I'd really like to share quickly is that our little boy is 13, but it cognitively is two to three year old. Um, this week is announced to the world is done a wee wee standing up. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <It's> massive. Brilliant. <laughs> massive. <laughs> and, and it's those, those achievements can be absolutely massive. Um, so if anybody wants to share something that's gone well for them and just lighten the mood, do write it in the chat. Do uh, do put that there. I don't know if anybody is. Something that they're really proud of that they've achieved or their child's achieved this week. I can't see the chat, so I can't see if anything's going in. Yeah, no. I will not... also say, sorry, go on. Sorry. Yeah, there's nothing there yet, Claire. There's lots and lots of comments, lots of really good comments. But I don't know how to I don't know how to like them all, honestly. The it's brilliant <laughs> just watching them. But I'm, I, think, I think for me the rubbish. I, I I have a number of sayings and uh, I guess this is an achievement. One of my sayings is every day is a holiday, especially when you wake up and your elbows are not touching wood. In other words, you're ready to be buried. <laughs> you're yeah. alive. Uh, yeah, so something's gone well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel saying Claire that she had a lovely conversation with a parent who said that she felt listened to and it feels like people are really cared for in Birmingham now and then there's another one we've received some lovely compliments and thank yous from parents and carers on the back of the statutory face transfer this was amazing and shows how we've changed the culture Andrea said our son experiences EBSNA but managed to go in on his worst day this week um. That's just brilliant. Yeah. Well done. Um, that, that about having compliments is such a lovely thing because more often than not, we only hear people when they're unhappy and they're mm -hmm. complaining. But to have compliments is just lovely. Really, just shows what a difference that can make. Yeah. But it yeah. shows what we need to build on as well if we're keeping it real. It's what is meaningful to families, what is meaningful to those children and, and young people, and what is meaningful to their families. So it's really valuable feedback. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to have to move on and I will say to people very shortly we will stop for a, for a break but we're just going to do another couple of slides and introduce an activity and then, then we'll stop for a comfort break. Um, so we talked about the celebrations and the, and the achievements but we are really aware that in any relationship, especially when you're invested and you're no more invested in anything than, than in your own child, that relationships can get strained. Um, and if we're talking about our hopes and dreams, that can be children, it can be wanting to do a good job, it can be our, our work role as well. There's a lot of emotional content and I think that sometimes get for, gets forgotten, but within SCND particularly, we know this. And, and sometimes when emotions take over, that can hijack how we feel and how we communicate. And so thing, we, it can either, uh, we go into fight, fight or flight mode or freeze. So we can't always get our words out. Sometimes we might cry or we can get angry, which is really conveying an upset feeling. Jane. Yeah, I think, I think that's an example of this for me is uh, my youngest child was diagnosed at two and he had no language till he was six. He weren't toilet trained till he was seven and a half, eight. Uh, and, and 
you know, the, a lot of need uh, or a lot of projected need at that time. He is actually at university now, still with needs, but is achieving really well. And I, but I really struggled. I really, really struggled to um, to to hand over to a nursery to an early years setting. To uh, they wanted to put them in a taxi, to and and the the enhanced nursery was seven miles away. So um, we moved house, and with six children, and that was that was that were five schools for six children for that year. It were difficult, but you do wherever it takes, and that. It wasn't so much as a lack of trust in the people. It was a lack of, it was a lack of trust in the system, in that these are our babies. They're our babies, and as our children get older, we do, we do, we do feel easier. But when you've got a tiny one like the children that you're experiencing every day, these are our babies, and when they're special needs, they're quite often, um, it the per the parent knows them inside out, and there's such a lot of fear and anxiety about letting them go into that. And so I think for me, you know, that emotion took over, but there were one particular practitioner who absolutely turned the narrative for me, absolutely changed it all. And, and I, I, I did go in in fear and I did, I did cry a lot and I got anxious and uh, you weren't doing this. And you, when he's doing that, this is what he's saying to you. And um, you know, that you have to look through his, his observations. And, and to be honest, it, I think, you know, she were amazing, the patients, but that relationship that we built meant that that I knew I could do that. I knew I could say that. And actually she took that on board and it went into as part of his planning. So what she didn't do was get defensive and said, don't tell me how to do my job. And I've been doing this for 30 years. I know where I'm on with, which she obviously did. Um, she took me and my little one as an individual and, and worked with us and ignored the times when I was bullshit or tired or, you know, and so, you know, coming back after that then and saying, I'm sorry, sorry that happened. I'm sorry I did that. Because I had that space to reflect and do that because of her, the way that she was. But quite often it's parents who are modeling that as well. Sometimes a practitioner is quite defensive. And so it, it this is genuine partnership is about equal partnership. So it means that it's about us changing as parents too. It's about, our ethos, our culture changing to get the best we can with what we've got for that child in the middle. Thanks, Jane. And I think there's something to be said about particularly for early years settings about because quite often it's that first encounter that parents have that's that creates the blueprint for what they expect, then what a parent expects next from practitioners. So it might be that very first phone call or the first time that they have to have that conversation and that, that needs that needs to go well because if that doesn't go well if that first phone call somebody doesn't feel as though they're being heard or listened to then the guard is up it starts to to go up then and, and you feel as a parent that you're not the, the the next person won't listen or the next person won't understand and that can just build that that sensation so it's the opportunity within early years to try and, and demonstrate that actually you can be welcoming and caring, you can value what it is that, that people are saying and, and to hear them. When things are difficult, when somebody's really upset or there's a lot of strong emotion, it can feel hard, it can feel hard within a setting, it feels hard uh, for parents who, who were feeling raw uh, and, and so we would say, work on containment, holding that person emotionally, just by hearing, validating. So we do that as a team. There's a lot of emotion within our team expressed and we rely on each other. So within a setting, it's about creating that culture. So it's OK, staff do support one another and there are opportunities to chat and to, ch to talk. And I know for parents, I know within the forum, for example, it's about being able to have knowing that somebody will hear you and support you. And we talk about empathy rather than sympathy. Uh, there is a good film. I'm not going to show it now because we don't have time. But if you wanted to Google Brené Brown, who talks about empathy, um, it's about being with people. 
you can't often solve somebody else's problem. It isn't about problem solving. It's about being alongside them and hearing them and validating whatever it is that's happening for them. So here's a that uh, Karen might have. And they're, they're all real, actually. They're, they're all what, they're all, they all come from voice in those first few years of the child's life before they start school. And it can be a really emotive time. Uh, from certainly from I've given that, that example from my own early years experience that really sticks in my memory that really did change the narrative this this was my youngest child of six and I already had a child diagnosed so automatically went in with what I knew that I would have to I would have to fight or I would have to say what I think needed to happen and that early years experience absolutely turned turned the whole story around for me and gave me it, it, it just did it just did it's and it's so like Kath and Claire were both saying I think it's pivotal in terms of early years that we do this so we're going to um we are going to go into a reflection time Claire are you going to talk about that yeah so what we're going to do is have a break now uh, we're a bit over time so um it's 11 23 so I think if we can be back for 11 30 but while you're on your break have a look at the scenarios and have a think about that any of those situations really some of them will be very familiar what is it that the parent or carer might be feeling in that situation and how might you use the cornerstones to empower them and build trust in you so how might the parent carer be feeling and how might you use the cornerstones to build trust and spend some time thinking about that. So go and have a coffee, uh, come back at 11.30 and then come back to this room. And at that point, we'll put you into breakout rooms. Welcome back everybody. So Eva now is going to put you into a breakout room uh, that relates to one of the scenarios on the slide. So I'm going to start sharing the slide again so you can have a look at them. Uh, so what we're asking you to do for the scenario, you, you will go into a, a room that's a colour. The name of the room will have a colour. And so you would look at the scenario that's your colour. If you can think about how the parent is feeling and how you might use the cornerstones to try and address or overcome that. And we'll just get some feedback from people when we come back it's not a long activity so I think uh, it's 11.35 now so if we can be back for 11.45 welcome back everyone it's sorry if you were mid-flow um, be because of the time and we do want to get onto the success measures um, we're not I'm afraid we can't take verbal feedback from each group separately. Uh, but what we would appreciate is if anybody does have, uh, so we hope that provided some opportunity for reflection from an early years perspective. So I don't know if anybody wants to um, share or make a comment based on those discussions. Something that Gail and I have done on our sessions, but um, I, I was, we were blue. Um, can I just say that's the only time I've been blue in my life? Um, but anyway, um, ours was uh, about the, uh, my child has just received a diagnosis and what do we do now? Hey, so what? Um, and you just left looking at one another. And I was sharing with the group that because that had happened to somebody in our group. Uh, and I was sharing that there's a lot of international research about that and how your appointment um, is, is in a clinical setting for about 30 minutes and it goes through right we've, we've looked at this and we've done this assessment and then therefore that led us to this assessment and that can go on for about 18 20 minutes and the last part of your 30 minute consultation is and um, wow this is what's wrong and that leaves you know that you've you received the information here there's something incredibly powerful happening here but in a clinic and in a clinical setting there's not a lot of time to deal with the emotion mm -hmm. of it so mm -hmm. that and the international research suggests that that is at the first point when it, when parent carers can often feel angry at practitioners 
and then yeah. the next time they meet a, a, um, a, a practitioner um, that then you know they feel angry it's, what, what we really need is somebody to give us information about where we can walk to find our tribe where yeah. you know, where can we find our place Thanks, Kath, because then you're left because you're left, aren't you, with holding all that emotion. It's quite a few comments in the chat that I'm just noticing as well. Listening and being solution focused, listening's the key, referencing the cornerstone, starting again with welcome and care. Uh, we said the key is to ask the parent how they'd like to address the matter and how we could support this whilst also acknowledging how tough it must have been to hear whatever it was that was was that was that group was discussing again the need to listen offer reassurance and it's balancing expectations with next steps because it is important to be realistic about what's possible we're talking about that ours was other parents have started to say things and the child doesn't get invited to parties so in terms of how that parent was feeling um i mean being there it's sad feeling just really sad yeah. all the parents to say yeah. things fear as well that they might not be getting the provision they need because obviously if their child's behavior or whatever is impacting on someone else anxiety uh, and in terms of cornerstones that welcome and care first and foremost and valuing and including what, what the parents say but also communication is key with that communicating to other parents as well um, and because because as it were you know Lu lucia said that one parent recently has said that what, what a weight off his shoulders it's been, the support that he's received from her and from her setting, which is fabulous. And it's, it's yeah. about relationship and about putting that stuff in. Thanks, Jane. Uh, I just noticed for the grey group, which is about just realising that suddenly you're going to be a carer, didn't expect that, they've got a full-time job already. So the importance of valuing and acknowledging what parents already do successfully for their child, asking them what's working well. Uh, the orange group, which is where the family keeps saying, and this, so I'm a parent carer as well, and this is what happened to me, kept saying that there's nothing wrong, that I'm being soft with, with my child. Uh, so the orange group, the challenge that parents feel, even with when their own family appears not to be listening, so the need for someone to be there for that parent. Parenting course has not always been the answer. I would totally agree with that. That isn't always hearing what parents are saying. Um, sometimes solution focused based working means observation based working, letting the observation lead to the solution. So yeah, noticing what's happening for that child. Um, often schools being under too much pressure to show results. So they skip the crucial page, uh, phase where the pupil is allowed to build up strengths and lead the way. It is important to be child focused, child centred. So thank you for that. Lots of good discussions by the looks of things. So, so I um, mentioned earlier that we, um, we recognise that, you know, uh, everything seems to have to have a measurement to it, doesn't it? Um, you know, wh when you're, wh when you're funded, somebody expects KPI, KPIs, um, you know, other uh, uh, thing. You know, everything's got to be measured. So we're going to talk about um, how we've uh, how we've arrived at some of uh, some of the measures. But first, I just want to remind you of the uh, the babushka dolls that we're all in this together. We're all facing the child, and that um, you know it, it, we have to listen to the to the voice of parents. And Gail Betty, would you like to say who that young man is there? That is my little, well, he's not quite 17 and a half then in that picture, but yes, that was him when he's a very cute little early years child. He's just got into his first forever home and at 17 and a half, so he looks very different now. And I've just been told today that they've just had COVID and he's now in lockdown, so I can't even go and visit him for Mother's Day. So <laughs> anyway, that's my little Fergus. Yeah, and um, Gail also, um, I, and you know, I have seen photographs of him, and he's still smiling. Um, and you know, Gail will sh sh has shared with us before about the number of um, 
appointments that she'd had. Uh, was it 139 or 136 in one year, Gail? Yeah. Across, across a range of services, across education, health, social care, and the interconnections, uh, different departments inside those organisations. And she was the conduit uh, having to communicate between each of them. So she became you know, language rich, really, in terms of trying to understand the communication. But, you know, so what we're trying to help people with is to look at how we can measure this. So would you like to move me on, Claire? So, OK, have I got time? Yeah, yeah. So uh, as we've talked about the four cornerstones, you will realise that there is a lot of uh, connectivity between them. There's an inter interrelatedness uh, about the four cornerstones. So, so sometimes when we talk about welcome and care, we're talking also about value and include. Communication th flows through it all and working in partnership. And I'm a visual learner. So um, the icons there are, um, it just reminded me when I was thinking about this, that love and marriage goes together like a horse and carriage. We can't sing it together, folks, because you are all uh, on different speeds and it doesn't work singing. I've tried singing through the lockdown with a choir. doesn't work, but, um, you know, you can mime it. So there's a connection between there. And the other icon, somebody once said to me, an apple without cheese is like a kiss without a squeeze. So the, the, it's about the inter interrelated and interconnectedness. Thank you. So this depends on everyone having access to the tool. Gail, can I just check that everybody's had that by email? I'm hoping you all have. It was sent out, I think, with the Zoom invitation. So can you just put your thumbs up so that I can see if you could get it? Yeah, great. Thanks, Cathy. Yeah, so definitely you should have it if you were signed up for this. Okay. Um, what I can do is share that I can share the tool. I've got it on a PDF open. So would that be helpful, Kath, if I shared the tool as, we, as we're talking? Uh, yes, it would, Claire. Thank you. A few nods of heads as well. So, yes. Yeah. OK. OK, so just bear with us. Yes. So hopefully, can, can you, you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Claire. Can you can you um, wheel down? Wheel down. That's a new term. Wheel, wheel down to welcome and care. What we will do, we'll send this out again. When we send oh. the slides over at the end, we'll also um, make sure we send this again to you in case you didn't get it. OK, so when um, Claire talked about systemic practice, um, we know that um, we have to take account of a system um, for, for most areas of our work. And again, I'll just re relay and share an experience with you. Um, Within a um, holistic family approach, um, you have to consider all of the people in that in those uh, in that family unit. Now, over time, services have been have developed. I I am so old. I remember generic social work. Okay, when we did everything, we did elderly, we did children, young people, we did children with with, with additional needs, uh, we did mental health, we did everything, and then we've got to a point where we started to carve people up into different departments. So you're three foot six, you go to that department. You're, you've got blonde hair, you go to that department. And we look at them singly instead of in a system. So when we had the opportunity to do holistic family work, it may be that a child's behavior was a real issue within the school, but you had to look at what was going on within the family unit. So, um, you know, there's some issues around parenting, but we, in one case, I remember, it was the influence of the grandparent on the parents. I'm very aware of time. I'm sorry, I'm going a bit off. So very aware of um, the, 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 uh, the, the uh, influence of grandmother. So what we did is we focused our work on grandmother to make changes there that impacted on the parents and in time impacted on the child. So it's looking at that system. Now, in these measures, if we're looking at outcomes, uh, success measures and outcomes for children, I'm chair of governors of a primary school. We've had some in our uh, early years um, sex, uh, section. We've had a lot of staff absence due to the lead member of staff being off for a considerable time. Having to get new people in um, and using agency staff is not a good thing for young children. 
they've been they've had most of their a significant part of their life in the pandemic um out of what we would normally do and suddenly they're having a lot of changes of of people in front of them that unsettles them what we know is children and young people must feel safe and secure so having children being unsettled by various members of staff um is not good and it won't lead to better outcomes for the children so one of the things that if you are in your setting in in where you are having a lot of staff absence it may well be worth looking at why that is you know so new staff coming in do they feel welcome do they feel cared for are they uh, is the induction right um are, are we um are we is the orientation right i remember somebody in one of our our workshops said that they'd started at a new um early years um provision and nobody had even told them where the toilet was so you know, you're a new person you feel you don't know where you sit where you're meant to sit at any break time or who's mug you're having but you know making that a very um welcoming to people is so so important because that will impact on children what we also know is where there's um a welcome for parents and carers they are much better invested in the child coming regularly so attendance can be affected if the the, the parents don't feel that it's a very welcoming and safe and secure place for children now what we've done is we've thought of a number of scenarios and a number of issues uh, within that welcome and care and would really value you um sharing with us as you start to look at it how um how you the, the things that you you cho choose to work on because you can't work on all of those around the four cornerstones but there may be some that stand out to you that are a real issue for where you are at this point in time and what we'd ask you to do is if you can is share with us what what, what you recognized what you did and what was the impact and the outcome for for, for um but you know the beneficiaries really of, of the services as kath alluded to there's lots of things connect together and that's why they're presented as a circle but we try to get things that you could measure so there could be so you can then show improvement and there's a grid as an example really of how you might want to do this so i'll just make that a bit bigger so really it's an action planning grid thinking about which which thing do you want to concentrate on? What would your priority be for welcome and care? What needs to be improved? How would you know it's improved? How would staff, parents and carers and children and people be involved? So what is it that you'd be measuring and what else needs to happen? But that, as Kath said, it's not in isolation because what would that link to? So if you were thinking about staff induction, for example, because that's helpful in retention of staff. So if the induction's good, induction processes are good, that might link to there being fewer formal complaints. So complaints being very low because staff are approachable and respond to issues readily and quickly. So that, that sort of illustrates the connectedness, but enables you to really prioritise and think about which one would be important for your organisation. So it's set out like this, but also towards the end of the document. So it goes through the cornerstones in the same way. So I'm not making anyone feel sick. Uh, but towards the end of the document, then it was suggested that for an organisation, for a setting, it would be useful just to have a tick list as well. So that you can really hone in on what it is that you, you're wanting to focus on and what you think you've already done a lot of work on, then you can move on to something else. And you know maybe the things that you want to put in into the uh, in to think about in, into those uh, measures. If you look at valuing uh, value and include, there's um, you know there are some there around um, equality and diversity. Um, so you know, are you only getting certain parents coming and involving in sc in school events? And ha have you got that right? And you know the best thing to do is to ask parents what they think about this 
you know, do they feel valued? Do they feel that they've got a voice in, in, in the organization? Are they there as an equal partner? Are they regarded? So, you know, um, I, I, I did some work over in the Northwest and they, they were really trying to do things. So they were presenting a fait accompli for, for parents and carers, to engage parents and carers. The thing to do is to ask them at the outset, and, you know, being uh, somebody who was a strategic lead in children's services at, with, with pre-retirement, I would, you know, I'd be eating my muesli in the morning and thinking about things and drafting it up and then trying to shape it over, over a number of weeks. But on that paper that was still, you know, eating, that was covered in muesli and, and milk and stuff, I should have written right at the top, parents, carers, children, young people, so that their voices were heard right at the outset. One of the things I do say is, you know, if we're going to make something, let's make it together. Um, you know, as organisations, we often present people with a, a document. Oh, look at this. How lovely is this? You know, if we're going to make something, make it together. And I give the example of a, you know, of, of throwing a pot is the term. So if you're going, if you've got a piece of clay, choose that piece of clay together shape that pot together decide is it going to be a jug is it going to be a vase is it going to be a bowl what is it going to be both put your hands in there into that pot as we are shape it together fire it at the temperature you've decided to fire it at you will decide how you get the colors you're going to use to decorate it and decorate it together and glaze it and only then is it a thing of beauty to be given something that somebody else has made who here's one i made earlier it doesn't have the value that it, rather than if you make it together, it is co-producing it together. And, you know, when we come with our ideas, um, and I'm not sure if this is my slide, but I'll go on, shall I? Yeah, so this is introducing the activity, Kath. Okay, you, are, you do it then, Claire, thank you. I'm no, not do you want, I don't want to interrupt okay. you, do you want to just... No, no, but, um, so when, we, when we've run the workshops and in genuine partnerships, we consider um, all of the elements that we that come together, it's our it's our social constructs, you know. So um, the, the the tattoo there is um, to demonstrate that we we when we see things, we immediately start to make judgments. There was a a long time ago there was a a piece of research in America that a child's journey through school is often determined in the first ten minutes of being in a kindergarten. Because if on that morning that child spilt the breakfast and they've come in with a mucky jumper, um, you know, judgments are made. So we, we have judgments and they're kind of inborn in us and we don't often realise that they're there. It's what your mother or your grandmother said, you know, it's stuck in there. Uh, we come with our different perspectives and uh, this always reminds me of Jane Fitzgerald and her family because, you know, um, there are, there's a, that number is the same. It's a six and a nine. And I remember Jane talking about this a long time ago. She may have forgotten that, you know, she she used that that number um, when they were having family discussions about things to try and see things from the other's perspective. That just because you're right doesn't mean to say I'm wrong. It's that you're not seeing life from my side. So as practitioners, as parents and carers and children and young people, we come with our, our own perspectives. And we, we have to consider that we're threading that into this work around welcome and care, value include, communicate, working in partnership and building that relationship of trust. Jane, did you want to add anything before I explain the activity? Yeah, just so you know, whenever we come together, we do bring those different perspectives. And so it, it's about remembering that that's OK and that we don't have to agree on everything at all it's okay the most important thing is is to have that value and include thing in our head at, at the forefront of our head that everybody's voice is heard the smallest voice is heard and that somehow we 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 can create that i don't know when you get time to create a pot Kath, because i certainly <laughs> got time to create a pot i'll make you one later jimmy yeah and present it me and i'll be happy with that and i'll put the candle in <laughs> or my gin and it'll be grand <laughs> but it, it's Thanks. remembering that, that that it's not about being right or wrong it is about perspectives and pe what people are bringing is what they see 
And if we want it to be real, if we want as parents, if we want to hear what is really happening, the real narrative for practitioners and their limitations in, in providing, and if practitioners want to hear the, the narrative of the parent and what they're bringing and what their life actually looks like in reality, then we've got, to, we've got to start with value and include and really hear each other first and foremost. So it's like investing that and remembering that it's okay if we get it wrong at the beginning and we don't always understand where the other's coming from. The main thing's to keep Hi. going. Thanks, Jane. It's so difficult because I can't see any faces. So I can't, it's hard enough reading people, isn't it, online, but I can't see you either. So I'm relying on their work in here. So uh, we're going to put you in breakout rooms again, but this time to think about that tool, think, think about how you might use that tool uh, in your setting or in conversations or um, in, in an area. Um, and whether it would be useful for you, if you were action planning, what would your priorities be from your particular perspective? So would it be useful? And also, as Kath said, any feedback, we're really uh, interested in feedback, how we can improve it. I've spotted something, exclusions aren't on there. It's something that can be measured. So lower, lower you know, you would expect minimal, if any, exclusions to happen in a setting that's, that's really promoting the cornerstone. So we, we can already see where there, there might be something that needs needs to be added. But what, yeah, what any thoughts? Sorry. Clay, there was something you said there earlier on about complaints. If um, if any of you worked in, in local areas and you see the complaints department growing like Topsy, adding more staff, just think what we could do with those resources. If we work together proactively and uh, you know, uh, with correct timing, we can reduce the number of complaints that we get and reduce the amount of money that we have to spend on dealing with complaints. Thanks, Kath. Um, so it's 12.13, so we, have no, we don't have more than 10 minutes for, for the breakout for you to discuss the tool, either if the breakouts can be randomly assigned, but the same numbers, uh, number of rooms what we didn't ask people to do last time which we should have done was to make sure when you get into the room to turn your camera on uh, and to introduce yourself to each other because again it's about relationships but, but to think about the tool would it be useful how might you use it and any thoughts comments feedback when we come back we won't have time for a long discussion so if you could if one person from each group would be happy to put a comment in the chat, some feedback in the chat, that would be really helpful. Uh, I hope you had some helpful discussions thinking about the quality indicators, the, uh, not the quality indicators, the success measures um, tool. If you'd like to put comments in the chat, that would be really helpful knowing that we're near to the end now but it would be useful for any feedback from you so if the different groups if you've got someone who can put your comments there uh, and while you're doing that I just wanted to say thank you to Naomi for asking the question about whether or not we've used the cornerstones to evaluate our EPS service which yes we have and we do go back to it and our service plan is designed around the cornerstones and quite a few other services have done the same thing in Rotherham. It is that we, we have a big push for service specifications to feature the cornerstones, and it's also shaping our written statement of action response. You'll be pleased to hear that co-production wasn't a key issue. Other things were. Yes, Catherine. I will also send out not only the measuring tool, which we'd like any feedback on, but also the quality indicators toolkit as well. So you'll have both sent to you when I when I send the slides to you as well. Would it be helpful? I think maybe the cornerstones approach, the original cornerstones approach document might be helpful as well. So I'll send that to you, Gail, so that you can. Yeah, no, I've got that already. I think somewhere, Claire. So that's OK. So grey groups use the action plan with early years settings to improve their parent partnership work. The tool would help start the conversation. Yeah, yeah and it, that's what it, so that's it's designed to enable those conversations and that collaboration. Pink Room are very positive about the approach, spent time discussing the EHC process, communication with parents and carers, and the importance of this for co-production. 
So yes, useful, particularly for that process. Um, Sarah, I really think this would be useful for those of us that worked with early year STEM partnership last year can see it as a way to refocus and take things forward. So thank you for those comments. If anybody does have questions, you'll get the slides in our email address is on this slide, which is genuine.partnerships at rotherham.gov.uk. So if you have any questions uh, that you'd like to ask us, we're more than happy to respond. We have one question, Claire, actually, which is, okay. how, have you, how have you measured impact so far? So in terms of our approach, um, what we've tended to focus on is qualitative impact. So we have got lots of qualitative feedback from areas, from individual schools, early year settings, parents and carers to tell us it makes a difference to their experience. This is a tool that's doing what Cass felt that we needed to do, which is to get some data to go with that. So hopefully this will help individual settings to look at what it is and to really measure some of those improvements. But we do hear from areas who, where usually it's working on, on particular aspects of their practice and coming together to make changes and we hear about those changes and how relationships have improved as a result. I think locally as well, one of the impacts and um, measures has been around around service specs. Uh, just recently we've done there's a big consultation happening around our 0 to 19 service and all the different services that that was within that. Um, and the cornerstones that, that they need to evidence basically well, how they're going to be. So that's been co-produced across the piece and part of the cornerstones at the heart of that and what we're asking people who submit a bid is to, because it's going out for tender again, is to evidence how they might embed those four cornerstones and what, what they would do in their practice. So that's going through different service specs. We've also done it for CDC. Um, and children, early years children's development service and, and again just coming together although although we've got that impact and we've got it embedded in systems the biggest the biggest reward I think the biggest impact we've had on families is that families are able to come together with practitioners but not just that the different practitioners with each other across therapies across mental health services across all of the early years settings in and what they might need to do with systems in order for them to communicate better and, and get better outcomes too. So um, this having the data behind that, this is very much the start of it. And it's, it's really exciting. But yeah, the impact is at the moment is absolutely rich narrative. Yeah, I've got to say, I would love you all. I will send this link anyway, but it's in the chat. We really need your feedback on um, on this uh, seminar to evidence to the DFE, hopefully that it was very useful um, and that you learned a lot from it, but actually to, to evidence that actually we want more of this work and we're waiting to hear back from the DFE whether there will be a, any extension at all for this um, early years work. So we're keeping our fingers crossed. Um, so if you are interested in any of the parent engagement and co-production work, then do get in contact with me. I, I put my email as well in the, um, in, in the chat, so do get in contact, but please do fill that out and I'll send that link again with the quality indicators tool, the measuring success tool, and we would appreciate any feedback on the tool. It is all new, it's all, it's all fresh off the press and uh, we would like any, any comments really. It's true, true co-production. We'd like you to see if anything could be added, you think could be changed. You know, we're, we really want to, to know your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you very much for attending. I'll leave that final bit to you, I think, Jane. That's your bit, isn't it? Yeah, just to say thank you and, and just to remind you what a difference you make, not just at the cutting edge as early years, but what a difference you make every day. And you don't always hear it. Quite often it's been said before, we only hear when things are going wrong or we've got anxieties. But, but every day you are making a difference to families every single day. So uh, on behalf of 100,000 families in, in terms of national network, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Thank you for embracing this culture change and let's keep doing it together. Thank you.